Hello again, this is Jeff Price, and I'm here with Pastor Trent. How are you doing tonight, Pastor? I'm doing well, doing well. Good. We're coming to you on a Friday night. Uh, no better way to spend a Friday night than to be in God's Word. So we're going to be talking about First and Second Corinthians uh, tonight in our Bible study, and uh, we'll, um, as always, get started with a word of prayer. Pastor, I'll open in prayer. Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you um, for your word. We thank you for Paul's writing to the Corinthians and the lessons that were uh, we learned from this reading. Father, I just pray tonight that you would, again just give us clarity of thought and mind and just speak through uh, through your word and what you have to say uh, to our listeners tonight. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's get going. Um, as always, I, I get to ask the questions, and Pastor, uh, uh, he uh, gives us his uh, wisdom and knowledge, uh, his, uh, vast biblical knowledge. He, he, I, uh, he, that, and that is a compliment, Pastor. I, I do my best. I do my best. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it every week. So, um Again, we're going to talk about the Corinthians, and when we when we start a new book, and we kind of like to give an overview. So, uh, a lot written about the Corinthians and to the Corinthians, and I think there's even a lost letter uh, of the Corinthians, is there not? The first That's letter. Right. That's right. Yeah. So there's at least one more letter. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of writing to the Corinthians. Maybe tell us why uh, Paul was writing and who he was writing to. Was it Jews, Gentiles? Who was living in the city of Corinth? Yeah, so so Corinth, you know, last week we had we had Romans, and we said there was just so much to talk about. Well, I feel like the same the same way this week. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Corinth is one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire, a very wealthy city. It was located on a, a little a narrow isthmus between the Aegean and Adriatic Sea, so it was a port city, which means lots of trade, a very diverse population. They hosted an, an athletic games similar to the, the Olympics, and it was almost as big as the Olympics. Really? That's good. Mm -hmm. um, it was a city that was known for its immorality. They actually, there's a verb to Corinthianize, and that meant to, uh, you know, to live lavishly, immorally. And so that's, I mean, that's that's not a very good thing. Like it, if there was a, a verb to, to Ada eyes, you know, I would hope it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like this. So, uh, but the city, they had the, uh, the temple of Aphrodite, which um, hosted a thousand temple prostitutes. So that was just the wrong, you know, the, the wrong direction there. Uh, there were taverns in the marketplace. Archaeologists have found lots of, of drinking cups and vessels. So um, very immoral city, very worldly city, a carnal city. And we will see that reflected in the letter. Um, Paul planted this church during the second missionary journey, about AD 50. And that's where he met Priscilla and Aquila. He, he started in the synagogue. That was his custom. And they kicked him out pretty quickly. But the synagogue leader became a Christian. And they moved next door. There was a, a believer who, who was right next to the synagogue. So they, they met there in that believer's house. Um, it was interesting. Um, Paul was there for a significant amount of time. So it was a church that had received lots of instructions. But now when Paul's writing this letter during the um, uh, second, or I'm sorry, the third missionary journey, uh, there's lots of problems. There's division, there's infighting over all kinds of petty things. There's immorality, carnal Christians imitating the culture. They've got lots of questions, questions about marriage, questions about food. There's disorder in their worship. Uh, there's there's some people denying important theological points like the resurrection. Um, and so as, as you mentioned, oh, you asked about the, the makeup. Is it Jewish? Is it Gentile? It's both. So they have a significant amount of Jewish believers, but also some uh, lots of Gentile Christians there. <clears throat> this is actually 2 Corinthians um, in, in chapter 5, verse 9. He talks about, I wrote you in my previous letter. Mm -hmm. So he had sent them a letter before this. There's probably another letter between what we have is what we know as is First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. So oh, this really? is probably okay. this is this is actually Second Corinthians, and our Second Corinthians is probably Fourth Corinthians. So <laughs> lots of correspondence, um, and uh, it was written as I mentioned during the third missionary journey about 55 A.D. from the city of Ephesus. Yeah, 
you know, I just uh, a layman's uh, uh, you know take on Corinthians. Uh, I I like it because I like this letter because Paul is so open with his own struggles with the people, and um, you know, understanding that he is he is Paul the apostle. He has been in. Uh, the presence of Jesus. We know he was on the road to Damascus, and and many believe that he was taught certainly by the Holy Spirit. May some were even uh, taken up to heaven and given instruction. Uh, so here we have this apostle, um, who is this great man, a learned man, but yet he uh, thinks of himself. I, I think he he says, "I'm not really all that great," you know, and. Um, I guess that's just kind of my take. And very transparent, mm -hmm. saying that I know you're struggling, but I struggle too. And so we're all in this kind of together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You can you can sense his frustration, but at the same time, he cares for these people. Um, you know, he wants them to succeed. And, yeah, and his, his struggles weren't carnal. His struggles were, I, to me, his struggles were, I'm upset with these people. I'd really like to chastise them. And sometimes yeah. I do, but then he chastises and then he, and then he comes back. He says, oh, but I really, you know, I really love you. And I really want you to repent. And I really want you to do better. I didn't do it because I wanted to be mean mm -hmm. type of, uh, of attitude. That, that's the layman's take on it. Yeah, I think you're you're right. Definitely. Second Corinthians, we see that. You know, he says, I, I inflicted sorrow. I'm I'm not sad that I inflicted sorrow because it caused you to change yeah, right. your ways. Yeah. I made you feel bad. Well, you deserved it, but sorry. I didn't really mean to make you feel bad. Uh anyway, okay. So we got things to move on. A lot of things to cover. All right. So um in First Corinthians chapter two, uh, Paul discusses a hidden message of the gospel. And kind of take us through why is the truth of the word hidden to those. I think it's very clearly here, the truth of the word is hidden to those who are perishing, those who are not saved. But then it talks about the wisdom being withheld from believers. So kind of enlighten us on this, uh, Pastor, and what Paul is really trying to tell us here. Yeah, this really connects with what he he's, he starts talking about in chapter one, at the end of chapter one. And he's he's talking about the cross being a stumbling block. And it's a stumbling block to the Jewish people because they didn't expect a crucified Messiah. And it was a stumbling block to the Greeks because they they were all about logic, all about man's wisdom. Hmm. And if we were to come up with a plan of salvation, this is not the way, well, this is not what any of us would have thought of. You know, we would have come up with something different. But God came up with the perfect plan, and God's plan is perfect. Um, so from our human perspective, the gospel is foolish. A crucified Messiah, a God who becomes a man and dies, dies on a cross. It just doesn't make sense to us. Uh, and I think that's what he means by hidden. Our eyes are blinded by sin. Our hearts are hardened by sin. And so coming to the truth of the gospel isn't something that we can do on our own. Um, we can't figure it out for ourselves. We need yeah. the Holy Spirit to open our eyes. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit um, convicts our heart. And then we can see the gospel. And then it makes sense to us. And we fall in love with Jesus. But we can't get there on our own. And I, I think that's that's a big part of what Paul is talking about here. Um, so so the big stump, the, the big obstacle, I think, the stumbling block that keeps a lot of people from believing is is our pride. And pride, pride twists our thinking. For some, pride convinces us that we have to do something to earn it. So, so grace, grace is offensive. No, I'm gonna earn my way. For others, it convinces them that, you know, I'm not a sinner, I'm I'm a good person. I'm I'm all right. You know, there is no such thing as sin. I don't need to be saved. For others, it convinces them that there is no God. Essentially, we can become God for ourselves. So pride twists our thinking and sin blinds our eyes. Um, we need, you know, we need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth. And so I, I think when we share the gospel, we realize we have to realize it's it's not up to us to convince the other person. We're called to plant the seed and we trust God to take over and make it grow. And uh, that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block, to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
And I think we can take a couple lessons from that. It takes the pressure off of us when we share the gospel because it, it doesn't depend on my eloquence, on my great plan, you know, my great um, message here. It, 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 um, it doesn't depend on my eloquence. It reminds us not to try to make the gospel more enticing, not to water it down so the world will be more attracted to it because then we lose the gospel. Um, and it makes us humble because we, we realized that we didn't figure it out for ourselves. Yeah. We weren't, we weren't wise. You know, in fact, you know, we're not going to go back there, but in, in chapter one, he says, God didn't choose the wise and the, those who were like the upper echelon of humanity. God chose the the humble, you know, the, yeah. the, the things that are not to, to nullify the, the ones who are. Um, so God didn't choose us because we were the best and brightest. He chose us because we, he loved us. So, we have to be humble. We we didn't get there on our own. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying there. Uh, you're right. Nobody comes to understand the gospel unless the Holy Spirit reveals it uh, to us. To us, and thank God He has revealed it to us. Now, I think you know there's that other group too that that has that revelation and rejects it, and mm -hmm. they they understand that. Maybe they should uh, accept Jesus, but they openly reject him. And they say, I'm going to live the way I want to live. And and people are are like that as well. But um, I think even in understanding, would it be would it be um, would it be doctrinally correct, Pastor, also to say that we can't really even understand a deeper things of the Bible without the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think in, in chapter two, Paul goes on and he talks about the Spirit's work of, of illumination. Right. So as we study God's word, we pray for, for God to, to give us insight, understanding. And so, yeah, that's that's a part of the Spirit's work as well. Yeah. Did, did talk just so really quickly, what is illumination and how is that different than revelation? Mm -hmm. So revelation is making something known. And so when God gave us the scriptures, that was revelation. And so when we have God's revelation, we don't need it to be revealed again. It's already been revealed, but we need to understand what God has revealed. And so it's like the light bulb that comes on and, and we can understand what God's word is saying. We can apply it to our hearts and, and make sense of it. And, and there are some passages, we know there are some passages that are harder to understand than others, but the Holy Spirit helps us to understand yeah. And I, I think that's a lifelong process. We study, you know, we we search for the truth and, and we ask God to, to reveal it to us. And and he does. Yeah. Yeah. Just before we leave this, one thing is uh, I think that's clear here is Paul said Paul never says that nobody that what what I want to say here, Paul doesn't say that you cannot come to an understanding. He does not say that. It's but it's directly through the Holy Spirit that we get that. And then should we I think my understanding is this, is that every time we open up God's book, we should ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Mm -hmm. and direct us. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think when we on Sunday mornings, I think we do that. You know, we see we ask God to not just to give us an intellectual understanding, but also to to speak to our hearts. Yeah. So that we can apply it to our lives. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Uh, talk about finances a little bit. Uh, tithing uh, is always kind of a touchy subject, maybe, in churches. Uh, I don't know. Maybe pastors are reluctant to talk about tithing because they, they think the parishioners, uh, may they're just, oh, he's just asking for more money. He wants a raise and, you know, a salary or something, but, uh, or the finances to be better. Um, but talk about finance. Is there an obligation for Christians uh, to uh, get paid? Is there an obligation for the, for us to pay Christians, uh, ministers, those who preach, teach, evangelize? Um, and then, um, well, why don't we just start there and then I'll follow up with some uh, other questions. Yeah, and I, th I think maybe pastors are reluctant, not just because of the, the people, but the world. The world always accuses the church of, oh, the church just wants my money. And that's not true. You know, that's, I mean, sure, there are some, there are some, sadly, you know, false teachers or TV evangelists or whatever that, that is true of, but sadly, it shouldn't be. And that's not the way most churches are. So, um, 
Yeah, I, I think you, you, you use the word obligation. And I, I think I, I just want to nuance that a little bit because obligation, I don't want to give the idea that, that this is sort of like a, something we have to do under compulsion or, um, or we have to grudgingly do that. Like, law. What's that? We're not under law. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between giving under law and under grace. Under law, there were these requirements and stipulations and expectations. Under grace, God wants us to do this from the heart. And I think the spirit is changing our heart so that we want we want to be generous. Like he's teaching us to be generous. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I guess to answer the first question in chapter nine of first Corinthians, you know, the Corinthians were kind of accusing Paul. They were kind of saying, Paul, you just, you know, you you're not a real apostle and and you just you're just in it for your yourself and paul's like guys when i was with you i didn't ask you for anything and i didn't even you didn't even support me i supported myself right you know like i had a right as an apostle to ask you to to support me but i didn't and and so paul's like what are you guys talking about <laughs> um so but i think paul lays out a principle that if somebody devotes themselves to ministry to full time ministry and and others are being blessed by that then they ought to they ought to support that you know they ought to support the work of god we ought to want to support the work of god as he blesses us so so, so the idea of a tithe in the old testament under the law was 10 percent. but my understanding is that it wasn't just 10 percent of what you wasn't just 10 percent of what you made it was 10 percent of what you made plus 10 percent of what you owned was that to, was that the case yeah, there's different types. I mean, there's different types of tithes. That's an agricultural society, and so you have the livestock and you have the the crops, and it's like it's it's not just like a it's not like a tax, you know. It's right. It's um yeah that we think of the ten percent, but yeah, you're right. It's actually there's it's more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah, and so we just we say ten percent. Is ten percent is that a guideline? Is that a is that something we should strive for? What do you, what do you what do you think? Yeah, I th I think. You know, we're not under the law anymore, but I think we can take that as a guideline and and apply that, you know, to our our situation. And then, um, you know, we we seek to give. I, I would say I had a pastor when I was when Charity and I were just married. We had a pastor who who taught on this and did a really good job. And he talked about the idea of being, you know, making it a, a, a regular part of of, you know, what you do. So not just giving like, OK, I got two bucks in my pocket, you know, on Sunday and that's what I'll throw in. But to kind of decide, you know, hey, what can we give to the Lord? And as a young couple, you know, you start out small. You start out because you don't, you know, you're you're barely scraping by. But right. but if you make it a regular part of what you do, yeah, you know, as as time goes on, you can you can expand that, and God enables you to do more. And and as we grow in our faith, we want to do we want to do more. You know, we yeah. we want to do more. And I I would encourage all young couples. Uh, you know, it's a commitment Trust and I made and early on and and. You know, um, we don't feel like, and even more so, you know, we we don't we've never felt like that was an obligation. And maybe that's the wrong word to use. That that you know, and and we we love to give. I mean, uh, it's just it, it. And I hate I don't want to sound you know like I'm boasting because like Paul, I would boast in the Lord. I I can't have that heart without Jesus Christ. You know. And, um, you know, it, it, it is, a, it's just a, it's a great way to live. I, and I think, and, and it, it should be a part of our lives. Um, okay. So let me broaden this out and, and, okay. So I listen to, I listen to TV, I listen to radio, I listen to podcasts, all these Christian people that I listen to, um, uh, should I be, is that part of our tithe? Is that over and above? Should we be giving our, our uh, first to the local church or can we spread that out? What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. I, and I don't know if I can off the top of my head, think of a, of a specific verse, but I, I think our local church ought to be our first, our first priority there. But, you know, we also have missionaries that just like Paul, you know, Paul was a missionary and, and people supported him. I think we ought to support missionaries as a church. We try to support missionaries, but yeah. But also when, when a missionary comes through, we encourage the people to think about, you know, supporting a specific missionary. Um, and that's a blessing. It's a blessing when you do that because you build a relationship with that missionary. Yeah. Um, but you, you mentioned like the, the different ministries, online ministries or radio ministries. And I've been blessed by a lot of those ministries too. 
Um, and I think that's that's also a way we can give we can give to the Lord. I think that would I would consider that you know something above, um, you know, um, you know if if we're giving to our local church, I think, and we're able to give to those ministries, yeah. that's that's great. Um, yeah, we just got this is this is the first the first week of the new year, and that, and that last week of the previous year. You, I don't know about you, but I'm getting tons of emails from different ministries saying, yeah. "Hey, consider us for right. your year end gift." And I, all of these are good ministries that yeah. I'm getting emails from, you know, and, and right. I want to give to all of them, but we, we have to choose, I guess we have to, you know, where, yeah. what are we passionate about? Where's the Lord le leading us to, to, to give? And we have to choose. We can't support them all. We wish we could. That, well, that's a good segue into this last part of this question. And, and, you know, it kind of makes me a little uncomfortable to get those emails, to be, be honest with you. Not that I don't mind giving. I, I love to give to them. Um, but I get a little uncomfortable with uh, media pastors, even maybe selling or promoting their books. Okay. So I've got this latest book out there or their merchandise. Now they're selling, um, you know, their shirts and their TV and their mugs and, you know, and all of this stuff. What, what, what do you think? Is that, is that, what do you think about that? Just, just among, just between me and you, pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I, I think we gotta be be discerning because we know there are some ministries out there where that is that is kind of what it's about, you know, and and that's not I don't want to support something like that. You know, I don't want to support a ministry that's all about money and, and raising money. But um, you know, there's other there's other groups where they they'll give their book away. They'll say, Hey, we got this book. We want you to have it. So just, you know, just sign up for it and, and give a gift of any amount, you know, and you give a dollar and we'll send it to you or, or whatever, yeah. you know, and I, I've, I've gotten books from those ministries. I think that's, a, that's a great thing, but you're right. There's other ones where they're trying to sell you anointing oil or they're trying to sell you <laughs> yeah. herbs from the Holy land. And it's like, yeah, that's where the red flags need to be going up and say, yeah, that's, that's not a, uh, yeah. All right. Well, good insight. Okay. Practical, uh, living for, uh, for our audience here. Um, Okay, so uh, talk about the Bema seat, or uh, well, I should, I, I mean, uh, I threw it out there. This judgment seat for Christ Christians, sometimes called the Bema seat. Um, paint us a picture, Pastor, of what what is this judgment seat of Christ, and is that something we should fear? Yeah, I don't think we should should fear that, but I think I think it can motivate us. And even comfort us. So you, this is um, for Second Second Corinthians five ten, and um, let me just kind of quickly read uh, verse nine. We we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now this is different than the great white throne judgment that we see in Revelation. In Revelation, we see the you know the the hell is emptied. You know and 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 the, the wicked stand before God, the books are opened, you have the book of life, and their names are not written in the book of life, so the other books are opened, the books of their deeds, and they're judged according to, to the, the wicked things they've done. Um, this is different than that. This is the believer's judgment, the great, the uh, the bema seat, and this is a judgment for, for rewards. Um, the, the bema was a platform in, in all of these cities, these Roman cities, there would be like this, this platform where the official would would um, settle judicial matters, would render a, a verdict. And so Christ is going to call us to stand before him and he's going to evaluate our life and our deeds and, and our motivations and our attitudes and our, you know, our, our works. Now we're not saved by works, but we're rewarded for faithfulness. And, and those faithful works, we're going to be rewarded for that. And yeah. you know, we, we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Maybe yeah. we've done things that are good, but for the wrong motives. And Paul talks about things being burnt up, you know, burnt in, burn up in the fire. It's not going to, there's no reward for that. If I did that for man's applause, you know, there's no reward for that. Um, yeah. If I've wasted my life, I've, I've lived selfishly for me. I accepted Christ. I'm a believer, but I've just kind of been lukewarm. I've been wishy-washy. I've really kind of just been living for myself. Um, Paul talks about those who are saved as through fire. You know, there's not a lot of reward there. We're saved. But we don't really have a lot to say, you know, hey, you know, we don't have a lot to offer Christ as far as our life, our life is concerned. So I, I think, you know, this is the testing, testing the quality of our works. 
I, th I think there's a couple of points here. How we use this life matters. So what we do here on this earth has eternal significance. So we're saved by grace. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is a motive to serve the Lord. Um, faithfulness will not be forgotten. How many times, may, I'm sure there are times when we wonder, you know, I'm doing the right thing. You know, other people are doing whatever they want, you know, and I'm, right. I'm they, they're ahead and I'm behind. And is there nice guys finish last, right? You know, is it yeah. worth it? And faithfulness will not be forgotten. God doesn't forget about our suffering for him, um, our endurance for him. It'll be rewarded. And and we will we'll answer to Christ for how we we use the gift of the life that he's given. Yeah. So we could see tears of sorrow and tears of joy. Mm -hmm. at that yeah, I, I think so. Not because I don't think I don't see it as the Lord with his whip and chair out there chastising us. Mm -hmm. But we will. We could always do more, mm -hmm. you know. We could we could have always saved one more, and I, those will probably become very apparent to us. I think, and but I think also there's going to be tears of joy. I I see this as uh, you know God's going. It's not like He's going to flash everything before our eyes or before everybody in heaven, you know, up there on the big screen, and 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 show a bunch of bloopers of us. I think a lot of it will be like a highlight ESPN highlight reel, uh, you know, where we're showing the best plays of our lives. I can see that. And, yeah, and people applauding and just saying, and you you know, the people who think that they that the people we think are, are doing really, really, really great work. Uh I think we'll I'm not saying they aren't doing great work, but I think we'll be surprised by some of the people who get a tremendous reward in heaven. Yeah, and, and we might we might see an impact that we've had that we never we had no idea maybe you've been praying you've been praying for right. your kids and your grandkids and you've been praying for your neighbors and you have no idea how god used those prayers yes if you were a coach you were a teacher and you have no idea how your example and your testimony made an impact right. on the lives of others yeah i, I think god will show us at that, right. and that prayer, prayers of my grandmother that are still being answered and and won't that be a reward in and of itself to see that to, yes. to say wow I had no idea I right. had no idea God used me in that way. Yep, yep. That ESPN highlight reel is going to be it's we're gonna there's going to be a lot of applause, a lot of tears of joy. I think mm -hmm. at this beam of seat, probably more so of joy and happiness and thanksgiving than of uh, sorrow. Mm -hmm. So not that we. There probably will be some things where we said, well, we could have done more. Okay. Well, Pastor, we we got we got to move along. Okay. So um let's talk about communion. Uh Paul gives further instructions here in uh first first Corinthians chapter eleven. So maybe take a few minutes and, and explain the purpose of communion and how we should partake of it. I'm I'm talking about what should be our attitude and our approach. Um you know, can it become too routine? Uh, and then finally, is it is this a religious sacrament that we that are required to do? Yeah, First Corinthians eleven is really if you're looking for the chapter that's going to give doctrinal instruction on communion. This is really maybe maybe one of I mean, there's not, there's more than one passage, but this is really a central passage for for the body of Christ how we celebrate communion. Um, different churches have had very different views, and this has been a contentious issue throughout church history. Um, so I, I think we see this as, as a church, we see this as a sacred memorial. So communion is a memorial, a serious memorial. Um, we approach it with reverence. We recognize what the symbols mean. The cup is pointing to the blood of Jesus that's shed for our sin. The bread points to his body sacrificed for us. There's lots of other things communicated. It's, we celebrate our, our relationship with Christ. We have communion with God through Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we have that intimate relationship with the Lord. We think of the upper room where Jesus first, he took those elements of the Passover and, and transformed them into this, this special observance. And so we think of that relationship they had with Jesus, but we get to have a relationship with Jesus too. Uh, it shows us the oneness that we have with fellow Christians. 
It's something we do together. This isn't really something that we do by ourselves. That This is a communion that we share together, and it expresses our fellowship, our oneness in Christ. There's Paul talks about how there's one bread as there's one body, you know, the body of Christ and you're members of that one body. Um, he doesn't tell us how often we should do it. He says, as often as you drink the cup. So he doesn't say, do it quarterly, do it weekly, do it monthly. Churches have different takes on that, and that's okay. It's okay. Um, you say, can it become uh, ritualistic? It can be. But I think I think that's where the pastor, the worship leaders, you know, we, we need to, to make sure that we don't get into a rut and just kind of tack it on to the end of a service like a little... Oh yeah, by the way, you know, we're going to, no, but, but integrate that into the service and explain, teach about it. Um, I shout out to our worship team. I, I think about some of our good Friday services we've had the last several years Yeah, and they, they are creative. They are talented and they've done communion in different ways. They've um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I institute community, but they, they plan the service around it in different ways that really make it meaningful. So I'm appreciative of them. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a challenge. You know, we we ought to do that. We can do it in different ways. It's okay. We don't have to do it the same way every single time. Um, you ask about, is it a sacrament? Um, is it required been, for salvation? Is it a sacrament that's required for salvation? Yeah, some churches have taught that, that, that this is something you have to do and you do it weekly because you want to make sure you're saved. And, you you know, if you don't do it this week, maybe you're not saved. That's not... No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, this, this, uh, we know we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, not by the works of the law, not by by rituals. It's by grace through faith. And so, this isn't something that we do to earn or to gain salvation. It's something we do in response to our salvation. It's an act of worship. It's a reminder. It it keeps our eyes focused on Christ. It keeps us humble and makes us thankful for the blood that Christ shed for us. Um, so no, this is not this is not something we do to earn earn salvation. Um, it's it's a memorial, a very sacred memorial. I, I don't think I mentioned it's a memorial for believers. So this is uh, you know we're expressing our faith. So we need to have faith if we're going to, if we're going to take communion. Um, so this is something if an unbeliever took part of this knowingly takes part of communion, that could be a very serious. I mean, is that a serious matter? Yeah, in in Corinth, Paul is correcting some of their abuses, and they were they were taking they were making a mockery of communion. Um, they were making a mockery of their fellowship with each other. They were making it into kind of like a a big feast, you know. And so the people who had had more, the people who didn't have anything, were in the corner with nothing. It was a problem. And Paul says, you know, some of you guys are sick because you know you're you you're being judged. You know, you're being judged because you're not approaching yeah. the Lord. This is a very sacred thing, and you're approaching it and treating it not in a sacred way. And so, yeah, um, yeah it's something we need to to be serious about. Paul talks about, um, you know, examining ourselves, examining our hearts as we take communion. That's This is a good time to recommit ourselves to Christ, uh, a, a good time to evaluate our lives. Maybe we need to surrender something to Christ. You know, maybe maybe there's a problem in a relationship that we need to address. Uh, this is a time to really reflect on that. Yeah, well, good, all good thoughts, and we're uh, we're we're over thirty minutes now. Um, I, I just want I want to I want to end up tonight and just talk uh, something that spoke to my heart, and is that I had a question here for you, but I'm just going to speak. Uh, you know, this term brothers that Paul Paul uses the term brothers nearly thirty times to talk to talk in, in addressing the Corinthian, the Corinthians. And, and you don't call somebody, Paul would not call somebody a brother unless they were in Christ, unless they were saved. Uh, and yet we see these worldly Christians who Paul addresses as brothers. And um, so as bad as they were, as much as Paul wanted to chastise them, he doesn't say you're out of the church, uh, you, you know, you're cut off, uh, you're no longer in Christ. You were never a Christian uh, because of all of this worldly things going on. So that is such, you know, it, it should be such an encouragement in our walk because we so often as laymen, we, we stumble, we fall, we don't do what we're supposed to do, or we do things that we shouldn't do. And 
um, we don't lose our position in Christ. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ. We're still in Christ and, uh, and a child of God. So that was just an encouragement to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that word brother, brethren, you know, brothers and sisters, that's a pretty special term. Yeah. Like, like that really, we're family. You know, we're a family in Christ. That's just, our relationships are special. Right. Yeah. Amen. Well, good. Uh, if you would, uh, Pastor, uh, would you close us in prayer tonight? Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of the Bible. We thank you for the letter the, to the Corinthians. And Lord, we thank you that um, we, as we read these words, we can we can see the victories. We can see the, the failures. We can see the mistakes. And we know that we all have those ups and downs in our life. And we thank you that we can learn from from their mistakes, but also from, from the positives as well. And uh, Lord, help us. We need these words. We need these corrections in our life. And so help us to uh, to be inspired, to be faithful, uh, to live for you, to live to honor you, um, to want to draw close to you and to one another. We thank you for that word, brother. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for our good church family. We pray you would draw us closer to each other and that we would be like the iron sharpening the iron, that we would be there to call each other back when we drift away and to uh, pick each other up when we when we are down. Uh, we just thank you so much for these relationships that we have in Christ, in the church. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Until next time, Pastor, we thank you very much again for sharing your wisdom with us, and we'll uh, we'll see you again next week. See you then.